2020 meeting the London City Council to order, and as I'm the only one physically present, I will do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the republic for the republic for the the one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you. So before we do the public forum announcement, I'm going to have State Manager Mulholland sort of run through the ground rules on these virtual meetings. Okay, due to the present situation with the COVID-19 pandemic, the uh, City Council has made a determination that it is clearly unsafe for them to meet in person, so therefore we are conducting this meeting electronically in accordance with the emergency orders issued by the Governor of the State of Hampshire. Uh, this meeting is obviously electronic uh, by those who are participating by WebEx, as well as those who are participating by phone. If you're participating by phone and when the time comes and if you're recognized by the mayor, you may be able to ask questions and make comments. I uh, dial star six on your phone that will allow you to do that in the meeting. Um, other than that, when you, all votes will be by roll call. And councils, when you speak, please give your name because those folks on the phone will not be able to recognize you. They can't see you. And remember the chat function. For those of you who are participating by WebEx, we do have a chat function. Councils, I would ask that you not use that for anything of any substantive matter because the folks on the phone cannot obviously see that they, and they can't hear it because there's no way to do that. Uh, if there are questions like you're having problems with one sort or other with your technology, that's one thing, but please do not have any conversations regarding any substantive matter that we have in force this evening. Without any further ado, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, so we'll start with a public forum announcement. Um, any member of the public who would like to comment on any item may do so when the item is taken up by the council and will be allowed to speak on the subject for not more than three minutes. And um, if we can get you on the line, and I hope you all can, uh, we're going to ask you to state your name. That's particularly important here where we can't physically see you. Um, give us your ward of residence in the city, if you know it. Um, and try to speak slowly and clearly so that everyone can understand what you're saying. So, uh, is there anyone out there uh, in the ether who would like to speak on any item that is not on the agenda for this evening. I'm seeing nothing, hearing nothing. Do a roll call council. Okay. So let's, uh, I hear no, nobody asking any questions that aren't on the agenda, so let's do a councilor roll call. Assistant Mayor Bilo? I'm present, Clifton Bilo here. Thank you. Council Bronner? Bruce Bronner here, yes. yes. Councilor Winnie? Yep. <clears throat> Councilor Hill? Karen Leo Hill here. Councilor Prentiss? Councilor Prentiss? Not, not here, Councilor. Well, she probably is muted. She has to unmute. Is she so. muted? Are you muted, Councilor Prentiss? I see her, I thought I saw her up on the side there, but uh, when she chimes in, she can chime in. Councilor Heisted. Erling Heisted, there. Councilor Zook. Yes, I'm here. Councilor Zook. Councilor Sykes. Present. Okay, so we've heard from everyone except for Councilor Prentiss. She just replied she is here, but apparently she probably have a problem with the audio, but she is present. Okay, she's present. So we have all nine councilors. Present then. Okay, so um, we have no recognitions this evening. We have three sets of minutes to accept. The minutes of March 12th, 2020, which is the canvas of the vote. March 18th, 2020, which is a non public session. And March 18th, 2020, which was our regular meeting. Would anyone on the council like to make a motion? I'll recognize anyone. Erling will do it. Yes, Council Heister, would you like to make a motion? I move we accept the minutes as presented the April 1st Council packet. So 
So that would be the minutes of March 12th, March 18th. Correct? Correct. Do I hear a second on that? Councillor Winnie will second. Councillor Winnie seconds. Motions have been made by Councillor Heisen, seconded by Councillor Winnie to accept the minutes of March 12, 2020, canvas of the vote, March 18, 2020, non public session, and March 18, 2020, our regular meeting. Assistant will do a roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Bilo. Councillor Bilo votes yes. Council Bronner. Bruce Bronner says yes. Councilor Winnie. Councilor Winnie votes aye. Councilor Hill. Councilor Hill will vote aye. Councilor Prentice. Okay, since we can't hear from her, we'll assume she's not voting. Councilor Heisted. Caroline Heisted, aye. Councilor Zook. Councilor Zook, yes. Councilor Sykes. Councilor Sykes says yes. Mayor McNamara says yes. For the record, I just got a uh, message from Councilor Prentice. She has voted yes. Okay, so that's nine, nine, nothing to vote acceptance of the minutes as presented. Okay, we'll move next to appointments. We have only one this evening. That's uh, an appointment of Gregorio Amaro as an alternate member of the planning board, and Mr. Amaro was interviewed by the city manager. So as you know, uh, the uh, charter requires that I nominate folks to fill the positions on the planning board. This is an alternate position. I interviewed Mr. Amaro. Uh, he's well suited to the position. He's employed by the by Dartmouth College. He did serve previously on a previous city board, the sign committee that uh, reviewed those provisions. And uh, I think he's, a, again, a well-qualified applicant to do, perform the functions of the planning board alternate member position. Thank you. So bear in mind that these appointments do not require a second. Is there someone who would like to nominate Mr. Amaro? Well, I, I nominate him. So you're nominating? Yes. Because he's he's okay. Does not require a second. Any questions of City Manager Mulholland regarding Mr. Amaro? Seeing and hearing none, I'll take a roll call vote to appoint Mr. Amaro as an alternate to the planning board. Assistant Mayor Bilo. Uh, Councilor Bilo votes yes. Thank you. Councilor Bronner. Bruce Bronner votes yes. Councilor Winnie. Councilor Winnie votes aye. Councilor Hill. Councilor Hill votes yes. Councilor Prentice. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Heisted. Heisted votes yes. Councilor Zook. Councillor Zook votes yes. Councillor Sykes. Councillor Sykes votes yes. Mayor votes yes. Mr. Amaro is appointed to the planning board as an alternate to the planning board unanimously. Okay, we have no public hearing items tonight. We also have no old business. We have several items of new business. The first is a request from Salt Hill Pub for exception of City Code Chapter 14, Alcoholic Beverages, to permit the serving of alcoholic beverages on city property. As you know, Salt Hill makes this request every year. We've traditionally granted it. Um, I'm unfortunately sure they won't be opening their outside seating uh, when they would like to this year, but hopefully they'll be able to open it fairly soon uh, thereafter. Would someone like to make a motion to request of this request from Salt Hill, respect this request from Salt Hill? I would be happy to. Councillor Hill would be happy to. Thanks, Councillor Hill. Would you please make a motion? I'll move that the Lebanon City Council hereby grants an exemption pursuant to Section 14-5, City Code Chapter 14, Alcoholic Beverages, Salt Hill Pub to serve alcoholic beverages on the Lebanon Pedestrian Mall within their designated outdoor seating area as shown on the attached map. Exemption shall be valid beginning April 1st, 2020. Fire on December 31, 2020. Thank you, Councilor Hill. Would someone second that motion? I'll second it. Councilor second. I'm sorry, please. Someone state your name and second it. Councilor Sykes seconds. Councilor Sykes seconds. Motion to made and seconded to grant the exemption to Salt Hill Pump to serve alcoholic beverages on the mall on a seasonal basis. Is there any other any questions? Very well, I'll call the vote. Assistant Mayor Bilo. Councilor Bilo votes yes. Councilor Bronner. Bruce Bronner votes yes. 
Councilor Hill. Councilor Hill votes yes. Councilor Prentice. Yes. Prentice, yes. Prentice, yes. Thank you. Councilor Heiston. Heiston votes yes. Councilor Zook. Councilor Zook votes yes. Councilor Sykes. Councilor Sykes votes yes. Thank you very much. Mayor McNamara votes yes. Motion passes. Uh, Councillor Ray also votes yes. Our next item of new business is a similar request. Uh, yeah. Mayor? Yes, Councillor Hill. Councillor Winnie also voted yes on that. I think he just got left off the list. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Winnie. It's all right, I'll let it slide this time. Mr. Do, you vote, do you vote yes? I do vote yes. Yes, I skipped the right yes. you, were, you were literally invisible. <laughs> Invisible. All right, the second item we have under new business is a similar request from Three Tomatoes Pretoria for exemption of city code chapter 14 alcoholic beverages to prevent the serving of alcoholic beverages on city property. Would someone take this motion? Um, well, Councillor Bilo here, I'd like to recuse myself from this item. Very well, Councillor Bilo recuses himself from this item. Would someone like to make a motion? Council Sykes to make the motion. Thank you, Council Sykes. I move that the Lebanon City Council hereby grants an exemption pursuant to 14-5 of the City Code, Chapter 14, Alcoholic Beverages, to Three Tomatoes Traditoria to serve alcoholic beverages on the Lebanon Pedestrian Mall within their designated outdoor seating area, as shown on the map provided Exemption shall be valid beginning April 1st, 2020, and shall expire on December 31st, 2020. Thank you, Councilor Slate. Would someone second that motion? Councilor Hill seconds. Councilor Hill seconds the motion. Any discussion? Very well, we'll take a roll call vote. Councilor Beal abstains. Councilor Bronner? Bruce Bronner votes yes. The visible Council Winnie? Councilor Winnie votes aye. Councillor Hill. Councillor Hill, yes. Councillor Prentiss. Yes. Councillor Heiston. Carolyn Heiston votes yes. Councillor Zook. Councillor Zook votes yes. Councillor Sykes. Councillor Sykes votes yes. The motion passes with eight and one exempt, uh, exception, exclusion, excuse me. All right. Um, next item. It is the presentation and first reading and set, setting a public hearing for May 6, 2020. This is an amendment to ordinance number 18, salary plan, article three, bargaining unit employees to include the position of assistant city engineer within the pay scale for the Lebanon professional administrative and salary employees the path the bargaining unit. And I will ask the city manager to provide a presentation. We'll see if uh, our HR Director Gordon Leskovitz is on the line. Hi, yes, uh, I am here. Can everybody hear me? This is Gloria Leskovitz, HR Director for the City of Lebanon. Yes, proceed, please. Okay, so I'm here tonight um, to request the City Council to begin the process of amending Ordinance uh, Number 18, our salary plan, to incorporate the position of Assistant City Engineer. This uh, will be a grade nine position in the La Paz unit salary plan. Um, and if you'd like, I can give you a little bit of background. Yes, please. Yeah. So thank you. Um, currently, this is a grade seven position in the AFSME um, bargaining um, unit. And this is the currently titled the engineering technician. Um, which is a funded position in the 2020 Department of Public Works budget. The engineering tech position evolved as the job functions expanded to include uh, duties associated with the city sewer capacity modeling um, and asset management programs. And due to the um, expansion of the duties and the professional and technical changes to the position, um, it also um, no longer fits the community of interest amongst the AFSME group. So we are moving that into the La Paz, which is the Lebanon 
uh, professional salary administrative employees unit, La Paz, um, and we'd like to rename that position to assistant um, city engineer. And again, um, the engineering position will remain in the AFSME unit in name only as a vacant position for now. Um, it's the city's intent to fill this position later on this year, um, creating a landfill gas energy project position, which will align with the AFSME unit. Um, we have met with both bargaining units and both units, AFSME and La Paz, are in agreement with the decision as well as city management to move forward with this. And the modification petition has been filed with the New Hampshire uh, Public Employees Labor Relation Board and um, is currently um, awaiting approval. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, counselors, questions? Raise your hand if you have a question or shout out if I can't see you on the screen. So Gloria, Mayor McNamara here. Uh, so this will essentially result in addition of one new FTE for the city once we hire for uh, the landfill gas position? No, no, no. This just takes one position and just changes its job description. Okay. In the last budget that was approved in December, a new position was created for the landfill, if you honestly probably remember that or not. Yeah. But that's the position for the, the right on the gas lines that are there in the right. landfill. Yeah. So that position's already been created. It's already been created. We just haven't filled it yet. Right, yeah. so it won't be filled to the fourth floor. And do we think that um, there is likely to be any um, delay in the landfill gas energy project that would cause us to delay hiring for this position? No, because a lot of the work that you're doing is actually laying, it's a whole other layer of pipes that have to be put in to capture more of the gas, so that has to be done anyway. Okay. But the landfill gas energy uh, project is a bit delayed because of the interconnect interconnection study that's going on right now. Okay. So it will not be done by December of 2020. It's more likely to be sometime probably the second quarter of 2020, which is what we anticipate right now. Okay. So, counselors, uh, what we're doing this evening, should we choose to, is that this is the first of three presentations, so there will be two more with regard to moving this position over to um, to the past. Um, would someone be interested in making a motion? I'll make a motion. Councillor Bilo here. Thank you, Councillor Bilo. If you make the motion, okay. I move that the Lebanon City Council acknowledges the first of three presentations to amend ordinance number 18 salary plan article 3 bargaining unit employees lebanon professional administrative and salaried employees la paz by including the position of assistant city engineer grade nine second i move uh that the lebanon city council hereby schedules a public hearing for wednesday may 6 2020 beginning at 7 p.m remote via Microsoft Teams for the purpose of receiving public input and taking action to amend ordinance number 18, salary plan, article three, bargaining unit employees, Lebanon professional, administrative and salaried employees, La Paz, by including the position of assistant city engineer, grade nine, as shown in the compensation and classification schedule for La Paz, as shown on page 30, two of our council packet this evening. Thank you, Assistant Mayor Bilo. Do we have a second for that motion? Councillor Winnie will second. Thank you, Councillor Winnie. So the main motion's been made and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion among the council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Assistant Mayor Bilo? Uh, Assistant Mayor Bilo votes yes. Council Bronner? Bruce Bronner votes yes. Councilor Winnie. Councilor Winnie votes aye. Councilor Hill. Councilor Hill, yes. Councilor Price. Yes. Councilor Heisted. Councilor House Heisted A. Councilor Zook. Councilor Zook votes yes. Councilor Sykes. Councilor Sykes votes yes. Thank you, Mayor Mackler votes yes. So the motion is approved nine to nothing to uh, move this forward to the next stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, counselors. Thank you very much, Gloria. Uh, 
The next item on new business is discussion and setting a public hearing for April 15th, 2020 for reapproval of the community revitalization tax relief application for Dana Seguin for South Park Street, Lebanon. I would ask Planning Director David Brooks to uh, speak on this particular item. Uh, good evening, this is David Brooks, Planning Director for the city. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. As noted, this is a request for an application for an extension of uh, Mr. Seguin's participation in the Community Revitalization Tax Relief Incentive Program, which is also known as the city's uh, RSA 79E program. In March 2016, the city Council approved an application, an original application, for Mr. Seguin for seven years of limited property tax relief pursuant to the 79E program. That relief was requested and granted in connection with the development of three additional property, uh, three additional dwelling units on property located at 4 South Park Street. Uh, there were some timelines within which the applicant needed to obtain a building permit, uh, which he was uh, initially unable to meet. In April of 2017, the City Council uh, granted an extension of that property tax relief uh, upon request from Mr. Seguin when he was unable to meet that original uh, deadline for the commencement of work. Uh, subsequent to the City Council's 2017 decision, Mr. Seguin uh, sought a modification of the project approval to propose four additional apartments on the property instead of the originally approved three units. Uh, the the planning board's decision in that case, dated March 13, 2019, uh, gave the applicant until April of 2021 to obtain a building permit. So now Mr. Seguin on March 17th of this year submitted a request to the city council to further extend the property tax relief uh, under the 79E program to align the timeframes of the council's 79E program with the planning board's approval uh, of the application. In this case, in considering the request to extend the tax relief associated with the project, the council is in essence verifying that the proposed project continues to comply with the provisions of the 79E program and would be reapproving the applicant's participation in that program. Uh, city staff reviewed the application and the, the status of what is being proposed uh, is located within the city's downtown 79E district, so it does qualify uh, or it can be considered a qualifying structure. Uh, based on the cost estimates, it would qualify as a substantial rehabilitation. Uh, and Mr. Seguin has outlined that the project will still uh, generate one or more of the public benefits for which the program uh, was created and which were originally approved in the in the prior approvals by the council. So at this time, under the terms of the 79E program, the council must hold a, a public hearing uh, within 60 days of the request and decide if the project still qualifies for the tax relief incentive program. I believe Mr. Seguin is on the call uh, as well as uh, a couple of others who might be interested in hearing your discussion tonight. Thank you. David, just for the for the benefit of the public, could you explain a little about the 70 program, the duration, and what it involves as far as tax relief? Uh, yes, the, the 79E program allows, it essentially freezes the tax assessment value to based on the pre-rehabilitation value. So the applicant, uh, upon council approval, uh, gets a relief in the incre increase in the tax assessment based on the value of the rehabilitation work itself. And it's for, it's for a limited duration. In this case, uh, it's normally up to five years. If it is associated with the production of new housing units, uh, the council can add additional years, which it did in its prior approvals, up to seven years. So in this case, um, by approving this extension, we're not going beyond the seven years, correct? I believe Mr. Seguin has requested the seven years again, yes. Okay. Councilors, do you have any questions? 
Does Mr. Seguin have any comments? Um, <clears throat> yes, can you uh, hear me okay? Yes, we can, Mr. Seguin. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, read a few things if I may. Uh, so par partly as uh, reiterating the letter I sent to the city, uh, I'm requesting a two year extension of property relief for fourth uh, for South Park Street, uh, <clears throat> which I call phase two. So originally I did five apartments in the main house. Uh, this uh, phase two project is <clears throat> rebuilding the L that had been torn down previously. Um, uh, David Brooks had summarized the, the, the timeline on this. The uh, 79E tax relief, which the city council had previously approved, that uh, expired yesterday. So, uh, so I do need to seek relief from that. Um, I, I still feel that this project needs to be completed. Uh, uh, the, uh, the property itself has, has the uh, rather empty st space in the back, back of the property behind the main house. And I've thought ever since I sought approvals and was grant granted various approvals from the city that this should be done. Uh, in the interim, though, I've uh, really come to the conclusion uh, things have changed in my uh, life and I'm working towards semi-retirement and I'm also engaged to be married and, <clears throat> and I'm not sure at this point where um, we will be living uh, once we are married. Uh, in the interim, I've <clears throat> recently met a, a Lebanon couple who has expressed interest in the property and they like the property as and especially like the uh, is the volume too high no it's fine it's okay <clears throat> so I uh, met a couple who uh, are like the property and are especially like the idea of building phase two. Uh, their names are Lorcan and Chelsea Nolan. They're Lebanon residents. They own several uh, rental properties now. And I believe they would make the perfect team to, to carry on with my original vision. And their intent would be to um, use the previously approved uh, designs um, with you know some possible modifications, but I believe they would do essentially what I originally wanted to do. I I feel strongly that they would uh, do a good job with the project, and <clears throat> we have signed a purchase and sale agreement. Uh, however, it is contingent on uh, the city council uh, approving an extension of the tax relief. And, and I think in order to do the phase two project, uh, the tax relief is necessary. So since I am still owner, uh, I'm I'm applying for that extension. To my my understanding, the extension is transferable to new owners. So I'm working with them to gain that extension, and again asking city councils. Um, approval to to extend that um, RSA 79E tax relief. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seguin. Does anyone on the council have any questions of the applicant? Uh, Councillor Hill. Yes, Councillor Hill. Uh, I I don't have any questions. I just want to say congratulations to Dana. That is really um, exciting news. Congratulations on your engagement, and uh, it's really. Um, delightful to hear that someone else is uh, interested in continuing your vision of this beautiful rehabilitation of a real treasure on our downtown Lebanon green. So thank you very much to Lorcan and Chelsea Nolan for um, being willing to take on that uh, continued project. So I, I, I full, wholeheartedly support this. Thank you. Would you like to offer a motion? I would love to offer a motion. Thank you. I'll move that the Lebanon City Council hereby schedules a public hearing for Wednesday, April 15, 2020, beginning at 7 p.m. remote via Microsoft Teams. 
for the purpose of receiving public input and taking action on a request by Dana Seguin for a reapproval of his April 19, 2017 application for tax relief under the provisions of the Community Revitalization Tax Relief Incentive Program, New Hampshire RSA 79E, as adopted by the City Council on February 17, 2016. Thank you, Councilor Hill. Would someone like to second Councilor Hill's motion? Councilor Bilo seconds that. Councilor Bilo seconds the motion. Any further discussion? Uh, Councilor Winnie has a question for- Councilor Winnie, please. Um, just regarding the, the permits and the program, are there any issues with the uh, potential change in ownership or do they, those things attached to the property rather than the applicant? Uh, yes, they they do attach to the property. The, the recording of the covenant for the 79E program becomes a burden and is transferable to subsequent uh, owners. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, counselors? Anyone from the public? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Assistant Mayor Bilo. Uh, Councillor Bilo votes yes. Councilor Bronner. Bruce Bronner votes yes. Councilor Winnie. Councilor Winnie votes aye. Councilor Hill. Councilor Hill, yes. Councilor Prentiss. Yes. Councilor Prentiss votes yes. Please announce your name. Um, Councilor Heiston. Councilor Heiston votes yes. However, there have been five breaks in, in this presentation, so I haven't really heard all that there was, but I supports the basic concept. Okay, thank you. Councilor Zuck? Councilor Zuck votes yes. Councilor Sykes? Councilor Sykes? I'm not sure Councilor Sykes is still with us, but uh, Councilor McNamara votes yes. Yeah. Oh, I hear Councilor Sykes. Councilor Sykes votes yes. Mayor McNamara votes yes, the vote is nine. Nothing in the affirmative. Thank you very much. All right, uh, and thank you, Mr. Seguin. Yes, uh, thank you all. So next we have uh, discussion and setting a public hearing for April 15, 2020, ordinance number 2020-05, the Men's City Code Chapter 68, fees, Emblem, a water development fee. And I understand that uh, Public Works Director Jim Donison has a presentation here. So before Jim can get started, I just want to say a couple of things on this. Uh, the city already has a water investment fee, and this is implementation of the water development fee, which is similar to uh, the sewer development fee that was passed uh, in December. To the customer, it's not going to fundamentally change what they pay. The amount is going to be basically the same other than rounding. He's going to show some examples of that. Uh, so that's the key thing to remember in this. We already have a water investment fee. And they'll talk about the difference between the But the amount that people pay is basically going to be the same. So, Jim, if you're ready, you want to share your screen again? Yes, I am ready. Can you uh, see our screen? No, not yet. We can't see your screen yet. How about there? Nope. We see you now. Yeah, I can see their okay. screen just fine. Okay. We're not seeing your screen here in the room. Okay. I can see Jim, but no screen. Okay. You can hear us. So we have our cameras on. We have our our voice on. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay. We can see and hear you. You need to share the document. Okay. We'll go right to the document. How's now, that? See your see that? Very good. Please okay. proceed. Okay. So Jim Donison, Public Works Director. I'm here with Jake Corelli, who's the Deputy Public Works Director, and uh, Jay's responsible as part of the uh, overseeing the water treatment system, the wastewater treatment system, and the uh, utilities group who uh, perform the water and sewer daily operations as far as any uh, water main breaks or anything to deal with the uh, 
the in-ground system. So Jay's going to do a presentation. He's going to talk a little bit about the water distribution and treatment system, a little bit of history just for the audience and the counselors. So you just have a little bit more background and then he'll talk about the uh, proposed revisions to the code for the investment fee and the water development fee. So can I can I just words. please uh, I just would like to say something real quick, please. Certainly, yes, Councilor Hill. So there is a lot of feedback going on through the system. If everyone who is not speaking will press the mute button, if everyone will do that, including just people who are sitting there, then there will be significantly less feedback. And we will, including maybe even a council, there is a lot of feedback coming through, which makes it very difficult to hear the presenter. Thank you very much. And presenters, that goes for you as well. It would really be ideal if all presenters could have headphones or earbuds in so that then we're not hearing your voice and the feedback. Thank you. Thank you. And so if someone wants to ask a question. Speaker, so you don't have the uh, feedback. And Okay, we are ready to start the presentation. With that, Jay. Uh, Jay here, Assistant Public Works Director. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Um, wait a second. This is uh, Council Councilor Bilo here. Uh, another little suggestion, so, uh, a, a refinement of what Councilor Hill just pointed out would be to turn down um, the speaker volume on your laptop uh, to reduce the feedback as well. How's this sound now? Sound acceptable? Sounds fine. Okay. Jay will continue. Um, so as you know, we have a, a large upgrade going on at our water treatment plant currently it's 3.1 million dollars uh, being constructed by penta out of maine um, this change we're talking about tonight would create funds that would be available for um, renovation and maintenance to the system where our current system with just a water investment fee is really for um, looking for new sources of water and for expansion of the system. So um, this would make funds available for, for um, projects that come out of our asset management program that's due on May 31st to NHDES. This will have an impact on our five and 10 year, uh, year plans for the water system. And this water development fee will make funds available for those projects that are are maintenance driven alone. So, um, can you guys still see the screen? Yes, Jay. So, quick slide presentation, please. No, go over. From there, uh, slideshow. There from the beginning. There you go. Okay, so right now, um, all the maintenance projects that we have that are included in our, our CIP and otherwise are funded solely through the water user rates. So this change, as the city manager had already suggested, won't change the overall fee significantly to a developer or someone doing a, a single family home or a project of that nature. But instead of having a single pool of money for a water investment fee that is only available to look for new sources of water and expansion to the system, it will include a second pool of money that's a water development fee that is available for uh, maintenance and renovation of the system. So we'll help offset those costs and reduce our overall debt service um, by, by creating these fees. So um, as I said, the water investment fee is for new sources of water expansion of the system. The water development fee is for maintaining, repairing, and renovation. So all we're doing is creating a second pool of money for a specific type of project that doesn't exist currently. This is the existing water investment fee. Um, it's set up 
by meter size and then for multifamily units it's five hundred dollars per unit uh, regardless of the size of unit it's five hundred dollars for studio one two three bedroom um, whatever it is so this is the current system that we have now that's been in effect since 1981. the change that we're looking to make um, <clears throat> we did a, a gatsby system valuation it's the government accounting standard board um, methodology and that is the exact same thing that we did to create the sewer development charge so later on you'll see the calculation for that and it'll look very familiar because it's the exact same thing um, the new water investment fee is going to be the difference from the calculated water development fee and the old water investment fee so we're keeping the total amount of dollars very close to the same um, we're just creating two pools of money as i already said so this is the gatsby valuation of our system this is the current value current depreciated value um, subtracting the grants and the debt service that we currently have <clears throat> and that's that value divided by the plant capacity comes up with a dollar amount per gallon and we used 210 gallons for an equivalent water unit, which is what we're calling it now. And that's just to be consistent so that when we use a sewer unit and a water unit, it's the same amount. It's, it's just consistent that way. So the total charge for this one unit is going to be $680. Um, so the big change here um, versus the current system is this water development fee is based on gallons of usage not water meter size so it's it's a little bit different but it's consistent with what we do with the sewer system so the water development fee which again is the dollars to maintain renovate things like that um, is flow based so one unit a single family house just like sewer 210 gallons we calculated to $680. And then for um, studios and one bedrooms are the same. Two and three bedrooms um, are a little bit more flow wise. These numbers come from our system. So we looked at uh, development, developments like Timberwood and Emerson Garden, and we figured out you know, those size units equate to that much flow. So these are real numbers for Lebanon. Um, the cost per equivalent unit is prorated to the flow so a one bedroom unit or a studio at 60 gallons per day is you know 28.6 percent of a unit so it's 194 dollars and and so on through the list commercial and industrial are based on projected flows and when you come up with the units they're getting charged the flat 680 per unit just like they would be for sewer um, this just shows that difference that I was talking about from the current water investment fee, um, subtracting the $680 for the water development fee, leave $70 left over for a single family house that would go into the same pool that money does today. It's just much less of a percentage. So it's, you know, about 10% for a single family house comes from, goes into the water investment fee pool and the remaining 90 goes into the water development fee pool and that's calculated the same way up through three bedroom units and commercial industrial again are, are calculated based on the projected um, equivalent water units so this is just a table showing what we currently have in the code on the left um, existing with to connect that comes right out of the city code as I already described and it's just being compared to the change we're making so as you can see it's the same amount of dollars it's just the two pools like I've been talking about for different types of projects um, so single family home like we always said uh, I got a couple different project examples here six hundred and eighty dollars to the water development fee um, and $70 to the water investment fee, totaling the same amount as an existing single family home of $750.
Um, next example is for uh, a larger housing development like we could have in the city. Uh, if we had um, 50 studio and 51 bedrooms apartments, that would be 60 gallons per day times 100 units, 6,000 gallons. Um, is 10,500 that equals 50 units at $34,000 total and then the new water investment fee is that difference between the 500 and the prorated flow based portion of the water development fee so that's where the 306 and the 209 comes from totaling the $41,050 so um, slight difference in total costs as opposed to what it'd be currently only because we rounded to hold numbers. So it's $75,050 as opposed to $75,000 even. So a um, little bit different with a commercial project, which is based on a larger um, water meter. So for a project like this, a 40 seat restaurant with eight employees, we have 20 gallons per day times 40 seats, 800 gallons, eight employees times 10 is 80. So 880 total, um, that would end up being 4.2 water equivalent units. That would be rounded up to five. And the reason we're rounding like that is back when we did the sewer development charge, that was a decision that was made. So this is just, um, being consistent with how we do it on the sewer side. So five units times 680, $3,400. Five units times 70. Again, the difference between the existing fee and the proposed water development fee, 350 totaling 3,750 gallons. Um, a restaurant of this size, Jim and I calculated, um, would need a two inch water meter. That existing fee is $3,800, so very close to what um, someone would have seen, someone would see today if we make this change moving forward, um, which is you know consistent throughout pretty much every scenario we ran. Um, and that's that's what we're proposing to do. So, um, so Jay, before I open up to the the council, a couple of buying, um, comments questions one I think it's important for the audience to understand that that this is a one-time fee this is not something that is assessed to them on a yearly basis correct correct so this would be um, part of the fees that currently are they they come from public but are attached to a building permit application so if someone's building a new structure it's a one-time fee that they pay as part of their building permit application um, the only existing customers that would be subject to this are people who are looking to increase their water service size. They could be impacted by this as well. And I recall a question that came up uh, when we were discussing the sewer fees, and I believe it was brought up by Councilor Hill in, 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 um, in the case of, for instance, a restaurant. Um, and Councilor Hill may be able to state this better than I am, but where you have commercial properties going in and out of different uses, how do you deal with that? Um, let's say that you know there was a 40-seat uh, restaurant in there, and it uh, went out of business and came back four years later as a 40-seat restaurant. Is the fee assessed again? No, it's not. It's it's one time as long as the the water service size and their meter doesn't change. Okay. Councilors, any questions? Councilor Hill. Councilor Hill, please. So just to clarify, that then, uh, if the meter size does change, does that mean that then the the new use, the new you know, whoever the new business is, would only pay the differential, or would they be paying starting from scratch? So that's a good question. This is Jim Donison, and uh, I guess I would like to ask uh, the city manager to uh, have his comment on it. But what we did on the uh, sewer development fee is the way we presented that was that uh, if a new if a change in the use happened, what we were going to do is take a look 
at the previous water consumption for that development mm -hmm. and then compare it to what the new develop the new use was going to be and charge them the uh, the sewer development fee for the incremental increase so that would be a question that, uh, I would defer to the city manager on and how we should approach that. So a, a good example of that, you have a single family Victorian old style house which we have in our downtown areas, and all of a sudden you want to split that in half and make two uh, two apartments out of that. So you're going to change the use of that. So it'll be the difference in the use. You've already got one unit or a full household, and now you're going to add another one. So you pay for only the the difference in use that you're projected to have would be that additional unit. If you've got a uh, uh, a 60 seat uh, restaurant and you're going to change it to a 100 seat you'd pay for those additional 40 seats only because you are somebody's already paid for the, the first 60 spent around since 1981 and in essence you're paying the same amount of money the only real difference there's two real differences here that just boil down to one we're not using meter size for the water investment fee longer we're using gallons which matches up with everything else that we're doing on the sewer side and the other part is the money that you would pay would only go into that water investment fee, which would have been to expand the system by public dollars or find new sources. As you know, we have no plans to expand our city water system by using public funds. Developers, of course, are paying to do that in some cases. But we have no plans to extend our water system at all. We do need to find some alternate sources of water. Right now, we only have the Mascona River. And that is one of the requirements that we have to do. So we'll use the money, the $524,000 that's in that fund right now, for that purpose the new money that will come in for the water development fee again will be used to upgrade the water lines and we've all seen the water main breaks we've had we know we've got an elderly system that has to be upgraded and our, our plan is like we're doing with the sewer system is to start to upgrade some of those older water uh, lines thank you councils any additional questions okay yes I want to get back to the basic problem that you're trying to solve, as with most changes, we'll have a, a need or a problem that we're addressing. And it sounds to me as if you're bringing in the same amount of money, or very close to the same, and putting it in a two different piles. However, aren't you going to be administering those two different piles anyway? So is there a problem in how it is being dispersed now? Or is there a problem in how it is being addressed that you want to change? So the, the current water investment fee is only supposed to be used for expansion and finding new sources of water. And as, as the city manager just said, we don't have plans to expand the system. So we have that $542,000 that is, is hard to use at this point. So by creating the development charge that takes some money that would otherwise go into the water investment fee pool and makes it available for projects that we can actually use that money for so you're right it is the same amount of revenue but currently that money is very hard to use for anything and we have a lot of maintenance type projects and uh, renovation type projects that by creating this development fee we could offset the cost of that using that second pool of money we're creating. Remember, the whole concept was to try to minimize the impact on regular water users, uh, just like we did with the sewer development charge, to put more of that cost on new people who are coming into the city, new developments, instead of the existing uh, rate payers who have been paying, all, paying these bills all along. And this is to help offset some of that cost. As you know, we've got some very high increases in water and sewer rates, and we're trying to find other ways to find revenues to kind of curve that or uh, reduce that spike in those rates. If we do this. Thank you very much, Jay. That clarified what the what the need was. And sorry if you'd explained it before, but I've had breaks in here that I don't hear all the discussion. But that clarifies that. Thank you. Any other counselors? You have Councillor Hill with another question. Councillor Hill, please. Thank you. How did you come to the break? down between how much of the fee should be going to the water investment and how much should be going to the water development so the, the um, water, sorry uh, we got a lot of feedback the water development fee oh, she's frozen
um, fee. Same thing we did with the super portion. Um, at this juncture, we opt to leave it same, uh, relatively close at least, the same amount of dollars, so there wouldn't be a a shock to to the Johnny come lately's right now. Um, we're that was the just the way the decision was made, I guess. That we're not going to change the fee, the total amount of dollars a lot this point. Um, in the future we might, but the the big change in how we came up with how much comes into each pool is added the water development charge. It was less than currently charging with the water vest fee. We said we'll leave that the same amount because it's what we're used to, and that flow based calculation basis for how the two things are broken up. So, Jay, we didn't get all of that. I think Councilor's question, question was more of was there a specific formula you used to make the differentiation between the water investment fee and the water development fee? Was it based just on um, this is how much we think we need for system maintenance, therefore this percentage is going to be the water development fee and whatever remains is going to be in the water investment fee or was there some other methodology for calculation? It sounds like the water investment fee is sort of just what's left over to take us to the same place we are today. That, that's exactly it. Which, the situation with the water development fee is a standard by which you set those fees. And you probably don't remember this when we talked about the sewer. But it can only be based upon the value of your system, the appreciated value of your system. So I would have preferred to increase, make that even a larger portion of the money that goes into that. But you, we have to follow that same standard, that methodology. I mean, I, I suppose we don't have to, but everybody else in the country is doing it that way, and it does make sense. Part of the problem that we have is, as you know, we don't have a fixed as, fixed asset management system. We're implementing one of those. If we did. That number of $29 million would be much higher than what it is because we don't have good data in our own system. So as long as we what I we follow what I call the rules, the standards that you know, the engineering standards, which we should, that's all the amount of money we can put into the water development fee because we don't again have good data on the value of our system. It's not completely mapped yet. Uh, when that does happen, that I would suggest we're going to take up more of that fee or we will increase the fee. The other part, of, and you're right, what's left over is what goes into the water investment fee, which is not the top priority. The top priority for the city right now is to fix its aging system that is literally falling apart. Again, we hear about water main breaks all the time, even when it's not even cold out, that's occurring out there. We've got to address that system. And this is a way to offset some of that cost instead of putting the entire burden on the existing users. Now, we do have to find a water source and we do, we'll have that 524,000 and some more money to be added to that, obviously for these new development projects that are coming in, which will help to get us down the road to do that. But the immediate issue is dealing with this system that really is falling apart. Uh, the other issue is that I simply didn't want to increase the amount any more than what it is right now. We get the sewer development charges, we just implemented those. That is going to increase the, the, the cost of every single unit in the city that's developed any industrial or commercial property that's going to add to the developer's cost, which is going to get passed on to home buyers, uh, those who are renting apartments. And I didn't want to increase that yet. I wasn't going to propose to do that. Let's see how the sewer development charge works first, at least a year to take a look at that. And then it's going to take us two years before we're able to adequately update the fixed asset management system to get good numbers for the depreciated value of the existing system, which will allow that calculation to be different. But in the short run, we don't feel like we're shortchanging the water investment fee. We haven't been able to spend the five hundred thousand dollars yet to look for an alternative source, or I would say a secondary source, and we're not jeopardizing that by reducing the amount that goes into the water investment. No, but if we think we have enough money to start the process that we need to start to look at other sources and other options. We do have interconnections with Hartford and Hanover as well, so that we have an emergency source of water if we do need it right now. So we've got the base is pretty well covered, but we are going to have to start that exploratory process of finding a backup source of water. Thank you. Council? Uh, uh, Add the comment. Uh, yes, Mr. Donaldson. Water development fee, one of the bases that it was on is the, uh, there's a manual of practice number one that the, number one that the American Water Works Association uses as part of uh, recommending water. 
development fees. And we followed that that model. That they have two or three different approaches, and we followed one of their approach, which was the net value of the system less the depreciation divided by the water treatment capacity. And then you come up with a per gallon basis. That's how we established the water development fee. Thank you. Councilors, any additional questions at this time? Members of the public. Okay. Hearing none, would someone like to make a motion? Councilor Winnie will make a motion. Thank you, Councilor Winnie. Please do. Move that the Lebanon City Council hereby schedules a public hearing for Wednesday, April 15th, 2020, beginning at 7 p.m. remote via Microsoft Teams for the purpose of receiving public input and taking action on proposed ordinance number 2020-05 to amend the Code of City of Lebanon, Chapter 68 Fees, Article 1, Water Investment Fee to implement a, quote, water development fee, unquote. Thank you. Would another council like to second council when he's motion? Councilor Sykes will second the motion. Thank you. Councilor Sykes seconds the motion. Take a roll call vote. Councilor Bilo. Councilor Bilo. Councilor Bilo votes yes. Thank you. Councilor Bronner. Bruce Bronner votes yes. Councilor Winnie. Councilor Winnie votes yes. Councilor Hill. Councilor Hill votes yes. Councilor Prentice. Councilor Prentice votes yes. Thank you, Councilor Heisted. Erling Heisted votes yes. Councilor Zook. Councilor Zook votes yes. Councilor Sykes. Councilor Sykes votes yes. Mayor McNamara votes yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, folks. Okay. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the 2021-2022 proposed legislative policy, which I believe the city manager is going to discuss. Yes, the New Hampshire Municipal Association every two years has what's called a legislative policy uh, conference. Uh, and prior to that, it's uh, there's legislative policy committees that develop what the policy should be for the towns and cities of the uh, state to recommend the state legislature in regards to uh, statutory changes, uh, things that we want to accomplish as towns and cities. In fact, uh, Councilor Hill and, and the mayor attended uh, two years ago with me, um, the last conference that we had. So the, uh, the, the, the situation is right now, it's a towns and cities can make recommendations for whatever the legislative policy positions they think that we should be advocating for. Whatever we recommend, we'll go in front of those committees, they'll refine those and bring it before the entire delegation, which is every town and city has a, an equal vote in that process. That was scheduled to start uh, next week, but that's obviously gonna be a little bit delayed and they're gonna have to change how they do that. But for our purposes, now is our opportunity if the city wants to propose any legislative policy positions. Now is the time to discuss those. I have a question, Sean. Yes, Councilor Hill. Um, I, so I, I, I think one thing that I'm interested in is given the uncertainty about uh, this virus and how long it will last and social distancing and everything. I, I think it's really great that the governor has issued the executive order, which allows us to meet remotely and then has issued um, subsequent uh, executive orders that will allow local government to continue um, in various ways. I would be interested in um, seeing if there's a legislative uh, offering that could be made so that we would not have to or so that maybe a there could be something that the governor could do to trigger this without having to have a, spe a, a special executive order again maybe you know if he declares that there is some kind of uh you know that there's some sort of a crisis going on then we can just have these things happening uh, you know, we can move to the remote functioning so that he doesn't have to issue the same executive order again and again and again um, in the future. So I'm interested in that. I guess the other thing is I am overwhelmed with trying to get up to speed on 
uh, schooling from home, working from home, dealing with everything and, and kind of being up to, upended by this virus that I haven't had much time to give this thought. And I, my question for Sean is uh, municipalities could, will have a little more time to think about this given that the, you know, the process is not really good. So, so can we take a little more time uh, or do we think that the April 17th deadline is really going to be a hard deadline? Uh, that, that, that's not going to be a hard and fast deadline. And to your point, there has uh, already been discussions about this because what we have is we have the chief executive of the state making these decisions and the legislature hasn't had a chance to weigh in. So the, the idea would be the legislature would develop those provisions and then the governor could trigger them and they'd be spelled out more clearly. And that, that's more the democratic way. But the governor's doing the best he can with what he has, obviously. But you're right, if the legislature can actually prescribe these in detail, these in much greater detail as to how they're going to work, that will be, that's more of a democratic process and that's what we're going to be asking for. Thank you, Councillor Hill. Any other councillors? It appears that we will have some more time for this so that if you want to give this some thought, um, if any of us could think of anything besides COVID right now, um, we can certainly get those thoughts to the city manager um, over the next several weeks. Just a couple of things if I, if I could. Yes, please do. So one of the things that I've asked as the chairman of the board of directors for NHMA is that we we have a lot of, you probably, I'm sure you've seen the policy positions and they deal with some very succinct types of issues. And I've asked that the, uh, the board of directors uh, suggest to the policy committee something that's far more broad, for instance, we don't have a policy position on housing. We don't have a policy position on public transportation. Uh, we don't have a policy position on right to know. So those bigger, uh, far more serious issues that are facing states and municip the state and, and municipalities, salt waste was another one, by the way. So those larger issues, they don't even appear in the existing policy positions. And those are things that we should weigh in on and we should make some recommendations to the legislature to start thinking about. The mayor and I attended the mayor's uh, meeting there well, several months ago now, and they brought up some of those high profile issues. What other tools can we give to our municipalities like other states have to allow for economic development to occur in their communities? We have, we have some, but they're really limited. Whereas other states have tenfold the amount of opportunities to allow economic development to occur if they choose to do that in their towns and cities. So those are, those are the bigger picture issues that we were, I'm trying to get them to focus on, and, they, and they, of course they want to, focus on instead of some of these smaller ones, like whether or not a town clerk should be elected or appointed, that's one that's always on there. And that's, of course, an important issue for, for towns, but these bigger issues apply to absolutely every town and city in the state. Good idea. I like that idea, Councillor Hill here. I like that idea a lot, Sean. I think that is, um, that, Sounds like you're bringing good vision to the board of the Municipal Association. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's always good to have some some big big picture positions out there that you can then build around with pieces of specific um, legislation. I'm thinking about our two dollar hotel fee per room charge um, that we've been pushing. We haven't pushed that under the auspices of a larger policy of giving municipalities more. Uh, leeway in how they can uh, raise revenue, but perhaps in the future we might be more successful if we had specific recommendations like that under the a larger blanket policy. We, we already have that one that has been a standing policy for NHME for a while. The other one I, I, I suggested was uh, climate change, dealing with the climate change crisis. There is no position on that from NHME that should be, and also energy issues. I know uh, Assistant Mayor Beal, that's obviously a a primary topic for him, and I want that to be more front and center for NHMA to be recommending. And most cities are very interested in that at this particular point, and we, we should have a policy position on that. Good. Any other councillors? Uh, Councillor Bilo here, excuse me. <clears throat> I, I would just echo uh, that 
Um, I remember uh, at one point in my life, I chaired the Assembly on Federal Issues, Energy and Transportation Committee of the National Conference of State Legislatures. And that's sort of exactly what we did. We, we found a consensus across state legislatures, supermajority, to have policy principles that would guide us uh, in uh, in, in lobbying the national, the federal government. So I think uh, that's an excellent idea to, for NHMA developing these policy principles around these major topics uh, that can, then can inform the great diversity of bills that actually get introduced that NHMA often doesn't have a specific uh, position on um, because they didn't necessarily expect the bills to come up. Thank you, Sister Mayor Bilo. Anyone else? Okay, so thanks very much and please be be thinking about this and get any ideas to the city manager if you would please. That takes Congratulations, Jim. Yes, I'm sorry. Comes Congratulations, on. you made it through our first remote meeting. Well, we're not there yet, but we're getting close. <laughs> city manager reports are next. Okay, so a number of issues. Um, I need some guidance on this. I spoke to the mayor and the system in this morning about this. Westboro Yard, uh, I've been in uh, email uh, conversation with DOT officials, and they asked me to submit a proposal in regards to the city's um, in kind contribution to take the demolition debris from the project at the Westboro Yard and accept it at our uh, landfill and solid waste facility at no charge to the state. That's a value of about $287,000. And so they asked me to come up with a proposal, uh, an agreement on that, which I did send them a draft. What I included in the draft, in the draft was that uh, we would take that at a value of $150 a ton, but in return, the state of New Hampshire would agree that it would not expand the existing propane facility into that very area. We're gonna demolish these buildings or allow any other development to occur in that area of the map, if you, the councils, if you're familiar with it, that show the red outlined area that we want to lease or purchase. Uh, so I put that caveat in there, and I also put in a separate, a separate caveat that would say that the property would be sold or leased uh, to the city of Lebanon for the next, in the case of a lease, for the next 99 years for one dollar, because obviously we're contributing the value of 287 thousand dollars to the project. They removed both of those provisions and didn't want to agree to that. And I said, well. Why would the city make that kind of investment and the state could turn around and, and double the size of, for instance, the Rhymes propane facility, which is not something that we want to contribute to. We don't feel that's the appropriate use of that property. And that, that could happen. He said, well, the state has no intention of doing that. I said, well, then there shouldn't be an issue with you putting that in the agreement. Um, but they don't want to do that. So the last where the email dropped off was that uh, they said that they, they might have to, they have to concern out where they can continue the project because they were counting on that $287,000 and then he'd have to talk to the commissioner, that being Patrick Curley. Um, so I asked, I said, well, when are you going to lease us the property? We submitted their application in 2018. Where are you on that? I never have a received response. So I need to, I, I think our policy position is, is we're not going to write a blank check for $287,000 and then they turn around and do things that we probably really don't want to have in that property when we have other plans for it ourselves. And I need to get some consensus that I'm going in the direction that you want me to on this issue. And it obviously could be an issue of brinksmanship here where they say, well, we're not going to do the project if you don't commit to taking the demolition debris and not having provisions in there that will protect the city. So my direction to the city manager this morning um, in our discussion when I heard about this was that uh, my feeling is that we should reach out to our reps and to uh, Executive Councilor Cryans and let them know of this current situation because I don't feel that this is negotiating in good faith on the part of the state. Um, they've stated their intention to not do anything on that property, but we have no guarantees that they wouldn't um, approve something in the future. And again, I think if we're investing almost $300,000, we ought to get something back from that. And what we ought to get back is that we're able to utilize that site for the 99 year lease period without the risk of it being taken over by another by a commercial entity. So I asked the council's opinion on that. Um, I have a pretty strong opinion on it, 
But I'd like to know what you folks think. Not to mention the four hundred fifty thousand dollars for the road we're going to contribute to on top of that. Exactly. Councillor Winnie. Hey. Councillor Winnie, please. Yeah, I I agree with you wholeheartedly. I don't think that um, the state has been an ideal partner on on the West Bar Yard to this point, and so I'm pretty reluctant to allow them any outs, especially with the state we're in financially. Um, I wonder if, in addition to Executive Councillor Cryans and our representatives, if Councillor Sykes might be able to um, contact anyone at DOT, or if that's that may be a little too back channel. But um, I definitely don't think we should be spending two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars with absolutely no guarantee, despite what they say. Right? Of the verbal agreement is, isn't worth the paper it's printed on. Thank you. So I, so I agree with you. Thank you, Council Wendy. So this is Council Sykes. Yes, Council Sykes. I I think where you where your general purpose is is important, and you should follow through with that because um, I don't think we should be spending that kind of money if they're going to not be partners in good faith. What I would ask is that we have something. Uh, more than just this discussion, whether it would be a letter from the city council to the representatives so that we can use that when we go talk to them, because I, I, I want them to know how serious the city council is. Is would, that a possibility? I would be more than happy to sign such a letter. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to take that, you know, um, forward because I don't, this is an important project for the people of Lebanon and West Lebanon. And we should we should have some stronger guarantees than well we don't have any intention. Okay, prove it. Right. So we should note that we're not expending two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars. We're basically giving them the value of two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars by accepting uh, essentially the broken up brick and concrete at our landfill, and they would have to they being the state would have to expend money to dispose of that material somewhere else. If we did not agree to take it, so we're giving them two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars worth of value, um, not expending anything on that. However, we have certainly attempted to help the project by purchasing adjoining properties that facilitates the new road out of there. Which, although apparently the state is not doesn't seem to really care, we all, I believe, think that it would significantly improve safety in downtown West Lebanon particularly with the propane trucks coming and going. So I think we've given more than enough um, and helped the state out more than enough. And I think it's very reasonable to ask that we're able to control the property um, that we're facilitating the cleanup of for a definite period of time. Councillor Hill with a question. Yeah, I think that Safety is obviously um, a factor, but the bigger picture is that this is actually really about economic development for downtown West Lebanon. This is um, some of the most developable land in the entire city, right at the uh, right on the river, right in our downtown area. It's clearly the highest and best use is not to have a lease that is what providing thirteen thousand dollars or something a year um, to the state when in fact you know if there were um, residents if there if there was a restaurant or other kind of economic activity the state would probably even see substantially more uh, revenue is there i guess the question that i have is is there a way to engage the it used to be dread i forget what it is now but the department of economic development for um for the state and to see if we could have them become allies with us in seeing a bigger picture for the Westboro Yard and not just staying um, locked in this very narrow vision with the propane, the subleasing to the propane. I wholeheartedly support all of your um, efforts. I think at the minimum we should have a right of first refusal before to, to either match whatever revenue they might be getting from you know, if they're going to if they're going to renew a lease for that has a certain price tag on it, then then fine. If maybe we should just have a right of first refusal and and we can pay that price uh, in order to secure the property. So I think there's a few ways that it could be structured 
um, to make sure that it's revenue neutral for the state of New Hampshire, if that's what they're concerned about. Um, but I, whatever, I, I, I wonder if bringing economic development into this um, could be a way to just kick it up and get it out of the narrow hole that it seems to be in. So one caveat to the economic development argument, and I don't disagree with it, is the existing contamination on the site. So removing the buildings and turning it into a flat grass site doesn't deal with a contamination issue. Uh, and any significant redevelopment of that site with buildings would require remediation of that contamination, similar to what we'll be doing now at, on Spencer Street. Uh, the state seems to have shown no interest thus far in uh, remediating contamination at the site, and anyone who wanted to develop the site would have to be willing to undertake that responsibility, And uh, because I assume the state will never undertake that responsibility, nor do I think at this point the city wants to. So while I think um, the economic development argument is a good one, that's where I'd be careful that um, tearing the buildings down doesn't clean up the site. Sure, and, but you can have, a, you can do farmer's market, if it's even if it's just grass, it's, okay. And you can have farmers markets there in the summer, which is something you could do with the existing contamination. You still have significantly more economic development opportunities, um, not to mention the sort of ecotourism that you can have of having trails along the river. So even as a sort of undeveloped natural green space for downtown West Lebanon, there's substantial economic development opportunities. Um, that are much greater than anything that they're getting out of their pro their lease with Rhine. I think there's also a reasonable argument to be made that cleaning up the site will facilitate economic development in other parts of downtown West Lebanon because it removes a blight and certainly makes it much more visually attractive. And that's bound to have a positive impact on anyone who wants to make a significant investment outside of that area, but in downtown West Lebanon. Council Sykes. I I'd like to applaud everything that's been said so far, but clearly the state is not looking at West Lebanon as a partner, but they are sucking energy or want to out of efforts to help West Lebanon. And I think that we need to stand up and I applaud the city manager for standing up to the state and saying, no, we don't need to accept your terms. But uh, Lebanon should be getting something out of it, and West Lebanon should have a a much greener, more scenic, more hospitable space than what they've had to live with for years. So I'm all for going in whatever way we can to get the state to support West Lebanon in some way. And we need the access. We bought the access. Now we have it, and we should do whatever we can to support West Lebanon to use that. So I'm very supportive of everything that's been said, and thank you, Mayor, uh, City Manager, for standing up to the city and uh, standing up for the city. This is um, Councilor Prentice. Can I speak? Yes, certainly, Councilor Prentice. I just didn't know if you, you could hear me. I've had difficulty with audio. I don't want to go, um, I don't want to repeat everything that's been said. There have been many excellent points made. Um, I just want to boil it down to a few key ones. Number one, the, the state is not being a good partner or an honest broker. Um, and this has been the difficulty almost since day one with this. The story just keeps changing. That's number one. So we, we really, I think, you know, a, a letter to the delegation, um, the discussions with Councillor Cryens, these types of things, they're, they're essential at this point. The second thing is uh, exactly what Mayor McNamara said is the argument that has been brought forward um, when we started this effort um, to you know, partner with the state to get the funding through the governor's budget and knock down those buildings and just basically clear the blight and have the upstream economic you know, positive impact on downtown West Lebanon as a first step rather than where we're at. And then we can think about things in the future. So thank you for all the comments. I agree. I want to, you know, stay focused on the immediate issue at hand and we need to force the state, uh, force the state's hand on this. Thank you. Thank you, Very frustrating. Anyone else? So I'll ask the council a question and I guess I'll ask it to say, would anyone object to 
having us prepare a letter that I would sign on the council's behalf to um, to the reps and to executive council primes as suggested by Councilor Sykes that would lay out our feelings on this. Okay, so when he has no do it. Councilor Prentice has no objections, please do it. No objection here. It's a great idea. Okay, I'm hearing no objections so far. So we, we will keep you advised. Um, you know, I, I want to reiterate that that I know, I don't think I know that we have we have gone the extra mile every time we've been asked here. We've participated actively, we've had meaningful discussions, we've not been obstructionist at any point in time, and we just seem to keep hitting new uh, objections on something every time we make a statement. So I'm hoping that we can bring enough pressure to to bring this to an end once and for all. I think the governor is certainly in support of this. Um, so, and he, I'm sure he doesn't know about this yet, um, but if necessary, he will. Okay, moving, other items. Yes, moving on to uh, COVID-19, uh, we started to take a look at uh, what we thought might be the impacts upon revenues and expenditures uh, thus far. Let's start, I'll deal with the expenditure piece first. Our expenditures have not been really that significant. There's been some overtime, emergency operations center costs, uh, but those costs are actually 75% uh, reimbursable under the Stafford Act on the uh, emergency protective measures provisions. So we're really not seeing a major impact on our expenditures thus far in regards to COVID-19. Also, we're looking at the revenue picture as well. A lot of concerns we had there, we figured that there would be a reduction in motor vehicle registrations, and that has so far not turned out to be the case. In fact, there seems to be at least consistent uh, where it was before. People are actually buying more new vehicles now because they can get them at very low interest rates in a longer period of time. So, so far that has not been an issue that uh, we're not forecasting one, at least in the immediate future, that being a particular problem. Uh, rooms and meals tax is the state's obviously going to have a reduction in that because our restaurants are closed, there is some takeout activity, and our hotels are for the most part closed. So there's not a whole lot of business there. So that's going to have an impact on that. We get a percentage of that. So if, if even if the the, uh, the formula stays the same, we should see some reductions in that at the end of the year. Uh, the formula could change, the legislature could change that because obviously state revenues in general are going to take a hit. The state could take that funds and, re and reduce it and provide less money to communities. We have no idea where that's going to occur. We have to be thinking about that. There's also $1.25 billion in stimulus funds, which is just an enormous amount of money. State, the state last year in its revenues took in something like $2.5 billion. But we're going to get $1.25 billion just from the federal government. For a variety of different programs so that's a lot of money coming in so we really don't know what rooms and meals tax is going to look like the uh, highway block rent money is based upon gas tax presumably that there's going to be a reduction there's less travel going on people are staying at home and quarantining so that eventually should have some impact on how much money we get from that although again that depends upon how the state addresses that formula issue whether or not it uses any stimulus money to keep that whole or not uh, the airport is, is taking some reductions in revenue because we don't have uh, fuel and we don't have takeoff and landings has been that's dropped off to pretty much nothing other than uh, uh, the airline that we do have. They're not flying to New York. But they are still flying to Boston. So there's going to be a reduction there, but we've also cut some of our costs there. And on the upside of that, there is stimulus money that's been provided to pay for 100 percent of projects, which is going to offset a big chunk of that as well. So. <coughs> Picture does not look even that picture doesn't seem to be all that bad. So for right now, um, we're not looking at any particular uh, revenue issues right now. Now property taxes, you know, there's probably going to be some sort of impact in that, uh, depending on what businesses do and how that turns out, how long, much longer this goes on. And there's no way to really predict predict that right now. But right now, we're just not. There's nothing to forecast. No evidence to forecast that we're going to have a shortfall. Any, any significant amounts of revenue. Councillor Winnie has a question. <laughs> Sorry, who has a question? Councillor Winnie. Yes, Councillor Winnie, please. Um, do we have any sense if 
airport activity is low enough that it might impact the essential air service? No, that's not going to be an issue anyway, because that's the already side. That's they're not going to hold that against us. Okay. The concern I have is Dartmouth graduation. That's when all the winter jets come in, and that's not going to happen this year. Right. So there's going to be a big chunk of revenue we're going to lose there here in the next month of May. How about impacts on our human services budget? We must have be having more demand. There, there is some because there have been some circumstances. We've had to quarantine people at hotels, but it hasn't been really significant. I can speak to that a little bit if you'd like me to. This is Paula. Yes, please. So, yeah, currently, um, I think the wave is going to come when the emergency orders lift. Because right now, people can't be evicted. Their lights can't be shut off. They can't have disconnected phone services. So I think more of a wave will hit once the emergency orders are lifted and people have not paid their rent, people have not paid their electric bill, so on and so forth. Thank you. One of the things that we're seeing, which is, uh, I'm sure, an intended consequence, but some people uh, are deciding that it doesn't make sense to go to work because the unemployment benefits in some cases are better than than it is working. That's not every case. Uh, and that's a particular uh, issue over in the North Country. That was an issue that was brought up today. Uh, as well as some of our construction companies, there one particular project we have, they said to their employer, lay us off. So, you know, and that's what that company did. So that's that's going to have a whole different set of problems for us at the end of the day. I've also heard, um, and I don't know if it's part of the 1.25 billion dollar infusion or it will be future, part of future infusions. But one of the thoughts is that one way to stimulate this economy after we're through this is to make a significant um, investment in public infrastructure, and perhaps some of the projects that we have backlogged, for example, in the in the 10 year plan might, and I suggest might, um, be able to move forward more quickly if there's a substantial infusion of, of stimulus money for public infrastructure. I'd like to ask a question, Tim. Yes, Council Brown. Uh For Sean, how is, is this going to impact our CSO projects for this year? Are they still going to be able to work? Yeah, the projects. The only project that's shut down right now is the water treatment plant upgrade. Every other project is still going, and contractors are working, and some contractors are coming in. And those are federally mandated. So, regardless of what the governor might do, in this case, our governor has has said that construction projects are essential. And so they're, they're deemed essential. Yeah. Are in our state, and they're still all underway right now, except for that waterworks, the upgrade of the water treatment plant. That's the only one. Thank you. I have a question when I get a chance. Yes, Councilor Sykes. Uh, again, for the city manager, I've been asked by a constituent is if it were possible for the city website to give a better indication of what businesses are open and which ones are not in Lebanon. I don't know how we would accomplish that, but that's the question. Yeah, that would be a bit difficult because it changes. Um, uh, you know, like for instance, Salt Hill was, uh, he was operating for a while and now he shut down. But I saw his truck out there today, so I don't know if he's going to be opening up soon. So it's kind of difficult for us to do that. The best way for us to do that would be through UVBA, the Upper Valley Business Alliance. And we've been talking to them. Um, and the mayor had, had mentioned it. Uh, the city of Claremont is doing, is working together with its businesses. We don't have an economic development department, department in our city, but UVBA is the L that I want to use to do that. And they already have those connections with our businesses in Hanover and the city of Lebanon. And that's the So method. you can bring that message to them about that well, there are people asking? Yeah, I will say, Councilor Sykes, that a lot of the, and I, in fact, most of the big box stores, for example, do not So I couldn't tell you today if Penny's is open. I have no idea. Um, right. And that may be what people are interested in is are the big box stores on 12A open? Uh, you know, not is West Summit and Feed Supply open because they actively promote that they are in fact open. Um, and so I think small businesses, uh, the small locally owned businesses are doing a pretty good job so far of letting the public know that they're they're open and ready to serve. I know nothing about the big box stores. I'm not sure any of us do, unless we mm -hmm. drive on 12A and 
see which doors are open and which are closed. Well, I appreciate the difficulties, but I did, you know, as a constituent service, I'm bringing it forward to you. Thank you. Uh, this is Councillor Hill. I mean, I just feedback for the UVEA is that they certainly could provide that information about whether the big box stores are open, regardless of whether the big box stores are members. That uh, could provide to the people of Lebanon uh, and, and to the greater Upper Valley and um, maybe just be a, a value added for them. It would be harder for them to sort of know, like if some of these stores are working on uh, limited hours, for example, you know, I sure of them reaching out to the big boxes that aren't members. I mean, it probably would be easy to do a windshield survey. And look at the windows. I'm not sure that UVBA can do much beyond that, but but I don't disagree with you. Anyone else? Questions on economic issues associated with COVID-19? I have a question for Sean. Yes. Councilor Hill. How many, I guess I'm curious about whether we, ha how much we have of community transmission in Lebanon and how much is really connected to um, Dartmouth College and um, hospital, I guess, is, do you have a sense of that? Uh, community not, really, or the hospital? not really for, for a good couple of reasons. Um, one of those is that testing is still not available in many cases. So the amount of cases we have out there, obviously, if you look on Channel 9 of the state website, they show 10 to 20 cases. But that number could be far more significant than that. Because again, we the, the testing ability just isn't there. And it's gotten better, but there's still, it's not, not everybody can go get a test that has been previously reported by other officials at government levels higher than us. Um, that just simply isn't available. So it could be larger than that. We, we stopped the issue of counting. It did. The issue of counting was valuable four weeks ago when we asked for it to happen and the state would not provide it to us. When we were reading about it on the news, that's how we found out about it, unfortunately. Uh, at this point, it doesn't really matter because right now we, we need to consider the fact that there was widespread community, uh, widespread uh, release of this infection in the community. That's what we have to operate on. And that's what everybody's operating on now. The issue of containment is, is no longer an issue. So unfortunately, that we're beyond that at this point. So we follow the numbers. I don't bother to follow the numbers because that really isn't relevant to us anymore. We know we have a problem. We know that a certain part of our population has COVID-19. We don't know what that number is. We have no real way to determine that because, again, the, the testing is simply not available. I was in on a conference call last week with uh, mayors uh, in the state and Governor Sununo, and the question was asked, could the state release more detailed information? They have been releasing number of confirmed cases by county, and it was asked if that could be released by municipality, and I believe the answer is reporting by municipality, but as the city manager says, I'm not sure how relevant that information is at this point for anything more than informational purposes because I think we're dealing with a real regional problem. Anything else, counselors? Next item. Yeah, I should have a few more items here. So obviously the electronic meetings piece that uh, some communities are having some issues with that, especially by the use of Zoom, which we are not using at this particular time. The mayor and team was uh, Zoom bombed, as they call it. And pornography was put up on the screen. We've implemented a number of measures behind the scenes to try to reduce that risk. We're going to be changing how we do these meetings as we move forward. And I suspect that the landscape uh, in terms of public meetings will be very different from this point forward that it will never be. We'll be able to at least hear what's going on, whether or not we allow them to participate. Each board is going to have to make that determination. But people are going to get used to this process if they can sit in their living room and participate. Now again, whether or not we continue that or not, where as you know, we had a plan and we've been we invested the funds to have that technology, to have that capability, far more enhanced than what we're actually using right now for October when the new city or well, the renovation of the city hall is complete. So again, this is going to evolve because we're going to have to deal with these outside influences that in some cases are disrupting meetings 
and school sessions and everything else that are going on. So just be aware of that. On Monday, we, we had a, uh, uh, an online session with 88 users and the bandwidth was so significant at 10 o'clock in the morning because the entire East Coast was doing this. Every school is using Zoom. So the internet providers just simply have not been able to keep up with demand. Uh, the video and it takes such enormous data load on there that it's overloading those systems. Now, it's, obviously, it's 8 o'clock at night now. Most of the East Coast businesses are not operating, schools are not operating electronically. So it isn't a, as big of an issue for us at night. Uh, at least it isn't for now. Uh, but again, we're going to have to, this electronic meeting process will change as we go over the next months and how we do business here. I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. Um, Project updates, the tunnel, uh, I did an inspection of the tunnel and the city hall projects uh, uh, yesterday, uh, actually on Monday, uh, uh, to, to look at those and see where they're at. City hall project is on schedule, on budget, and it, it continues to, uh, to chug along there. At some point, I'm gonna schedule a, uh, a tour for counselors. I wanna wait for a little bit more work has been done so you can get a tour of the site, but we can do that prior to the meeting. We'll go over there and, and do all that. So you can see what that looks like over there. Uh, the tunnel project is on budget and on schedule as well. Uh, there's a small cut in the fabric material. If you stand on the sidewalk at Hanover Street, you can look right down through the tunnel. We did that so the public can view that. That has been done. That, that exists right now. 20 Spencer Street, by the end of the month, they will have the buildings uh, removed uh, at the old DPW site. They've been working on there, removing the, uh, the existing tanks. Uh, and the, uh, the lead paint that's there, and they'll be removing the contaminated soil as well. DES has been on site to inspect that. So that project is moving quite well. And that is all I have. Okay. Um, Councils, you should have all received quarterly reports from the Historic District Commission and the Head Bike Committee. Um, do we have any council reps to other bodies who have anything of particular importance to raise tonight. Okay. Hearing none, uh, do you want to have any discussion of future agenda items or? Sure, we can go with those. Over Let's here. do it. Okay. So, April 15th, obviously, the public hearings you just set tonight, those will be occurring uh, on that particular date. We are also hoping the council will consider the statutory provisions of enable those for the tax exemption of battery storage, which we don't have a whole lot of in this community, but we will with the use of solar and the projects that the system of Velo is working on, uh, the battery pilot project, and that will allow for those, that, that equipment that's gonna be in a particular house will be tax exempt, something for the council to consider that was passed in legislation last year, and we wanna bring that before you to decide what you wish to do on that. We're also looking at the presentation of the West Lebanon Charette at the next meeting on the 15th and discuss the next steps on that. And hopefully a presentation of the solid waste business plan um, before you on that particular day. May 6th, uh, right now the only thing we've got scheduled is the ordinance uh, 18 provisions. And we are gonna be coming with a quarterly financial report. I'm not sure if that's gonna be on the 6th of the meeting after that. Also keep in mind, we have the annual outcomes workshops that are coming up at the end of this month. In fact, well, I'll, do is I'll give you the dates just as a reminder right now for those. We've got the 28th and the 30th for those two workshops, and then there'll be, the last one will be on May 13th. Sean, that's when uh, Vicki will also be present to do the actual uh, quarterly budget. So you do it on the same night as the financial outlook. Okay, perfect, then that's, that'll take care of that then. Great. And that's the immediate schedule that we have in front of you. Okay. We will not be having a non-public session tonight, so I guess that we are prepared for a motion by council. One more thing, Class 6 Roads Committee, uh, we're going to reconstitute that. Or that'll be coming up. Uh, I think we got that coming up on the 15th. On the 15th of April. Yeah, so we can get that back in, in, in circulation. Correct. Yeah. I'd council, like to make a motion. Please do, Council Bronner. I move we adjourn. We have a second to Council Bronner's motion. I'll second that. Council Bilo. Council Bilo seconds the motion to adjourn. Okay, let's do a roll call vote. Sister Mayor Bilo. Uh, Councilor Bilo votes yes. Council Bronner. Bruce Bronner says yes. Councilor Winnie. Councilor Winnie votes aye. Councilor Hill. 
Councilor Hill votes yes. Councilor Prentice. Councilor Prentice votes yes. Councilor Heiston. Hallelujah. Councilor Zook. That was an I. <laughs> Councilor Zook. Councilor Zook votes yes. Thank you, Councilor Zook. Councilor Sykes. Councilor Sykes votes yes. And Mayor McNamara concurs. Thank you all for, I think, is a very successful first online meeting. Um, we're not kidding when we say we're out ahead of most municipalities in the state on this, and there several of them are looking to us for advice. Um, so thank you all for your participation in this. Thank you, public, those of you who are out there, and uh, we hope to make this better and better as we go forward. Thank you very much, and good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night.